Thanks. Um, so what I'm going to do is try and build on some of the points that Isabel has made. And I'm going to um, speak about, if we think about peace on a spectrum, and we know that these things are not linear, but if we think about peace as having three kind of main elements to it, a peacemaking, peace building and peacekeeping, I'm really focusing on the peacemaking end of things and what's happening with gender. And in the peacemaking um, bit of things, you see things like peace talks, peace agreements and peace implementation. And I'm going to do a very, very, very super brief um, overview of some of the things that are a little problematic when we're thinking about gender justice. And I'm going to focus on one thing in particular which I think is really relevant for this men engaged community and that is the necessity of more gender advisors in the peace process system. Um, as uh, Joe said, I also sort of have another hat um, and that relates to um, gun violence. And the presentation that I would like to give if I had more time is on the PowerPoint. So if you would like to know more about that, please download the PowerPoint. But I'm going to try and just touch on that a little briefly as well. So um, I'm skipping through some of the slides. So I do encourage you to, if you want more information, please look at the PowerPoint. And I've hyperlinked a couple of things as well. So if we were to do a bit of a stock take about where gender is at on um, this particular element of the peace spectrum, looking at talks and agreements, um, it's pretty woeful. So what we see is um, a persistence in women being excluded from substantive participation in peace talks aside from organising the logistics of them. And one of the, the trends that has emerged in the very recent past is the conflation of inclusion and participation. Now, 1325 and all the sister resolutions and a whole range of other normative standards argue consistently that women's participation in all matters of peace is essential. But what we're seeing, and I think it's a space to watch and a space to be a little critical about, is the rise of inclusion. Now, that sounds good. We want women's inclusion and we want their participation. But what you're increasingly starting to see creeping into policy documents is dropping of participation and broad references to inclusion. And why does that matter? I'm going to give you an example. So one of the places that I am um, involved in a peace process in um, has um, live ceasefire negotiations going on at the moment. There is a plethora of armed groups. Um, a grouping of them has come together to negotiate as a block. They don't represent all the armed groups in this particular conflict. Uh, but they represent a sizable amount, indeed 16 of them. So when this group comes together, um, to negotiate with the government and the military. They try to do so as a block. But in order for them to do that, they need to negotiate amongst themselves. They have this incredibly elaborate system for how people come to be on the negotiating team. So what they have is 16 individuals that are representative of these armed groups. There are 15 men and there is one woman. Now, in a recent round of ceasefire negotiations, when the bloc was negotiating with the government, a member of the government told this woman to be quiet. And when he told her to be quiet, he also um, used, used a phrase that referenced her gender and her ethnic identity. And none of her male colleagues, ostensibly, on her side, came to her defence. Now, her participation evaporated in that moment, but she was still included. So on paper, they have a woman. She's included. We have a form of inclusion in the process. What's the matter? It's just that she's been effectively silenced, not just by the opposition, but by her own colleagues. 
And this is a trend that we see consistently and it's a, it's a really fine line between thinking carefully and critically about inclusion and participation. Another one, and it's a no-brainer, is that men dominate the field of international mediation. But it is one part of the peace um, agreement and negotiation spectrum that the international community does have some influence over. But unless the pipeline for becoming a mediator is not that you were a former foreign minister anymore, then we're going to still see men persisting as dominating as mediators. If the pipeline is that you have competence as a mediator, then we'll start to see more diversity. Not just more women coming into the the field of international mediation, but we'll see more diversity amongst the men because they're a relatively homogenous group. There is incredibly weak accountability when gender is overlooked or poorly included or when women are excluded or, or um, um, poorly involved in processes. Um, and as Isabel has referenced, we have a lot of normative frameworks in place, but when particularly international mediation processes don't abide by them or implement them, there is very little recourse. It's very, very difficult to have any um, accountability in the system. There is also enormous pressure on um, the few women that are involved in these processes to do it all. Peace agreements also continue to have incredibly weak reference to gender across the board, across really important issues. Peace agreements typically focus on constitutions, power sharing, security, etc. But you all you will generally see a very weak preamble reference and it's usually to women and children. Um, my colleagues and I, we did a study looking at some peace agreements in the Asia region spanning 20 years. We looked at um, typical clauses, power sharing, constitutions. We looked at what would have happened if they had been written with gender perspective in mind, so we edited them and rewrote them. And um, there's a link in the PowerPoint to that. But it, it suggests that we have got quite a long way to go. So there are three common re responses when we are talking with mediators, conflict parties. Conflict parties are typically rebel groups, armies and governments. They typically say, yeah, well, you know, we're not opposed to including gender um, and women's rights, but what do you want us to do exactly? So there's a, there's a lack of guidance, a lack of guidance that is meaningful to these parties. So we need to change some of the way that we're explaining some of these concepts. Second thing is, and this is the more prevalent thing, is that addressing gender is beyond what we can ask of the parties because this, it's a cultural norm in this context and, and it's got nothing really to do with this peace agreement, this peace process. The third thing is that the parties say, yeah, it, look, it's it, it is an important issue, but right now is not the right time. But we know that um, gender and women's rights issues get pushed further and further down the agenda. So what do we need to do about this? Well, there are many things that we need to do about them. And one of the things that I really want to focus on today is in peace talks, um, there's, a, there's a lot of pressure, there's often a lot of timing issues, and there's a lot of questions um, around the type of advice that is given. Now, 1325 has led to the emergence of gender advisors in peace processes. There is also another um, type of gender advisor, the women's protection advisor. I'm not going to touch on that, but it, I think it is kind of important to be aware of. Um, so in the last 15 years, there has been development of, of gender advisors. Now, they're deployed by a wide range of entities, the UN, regional organisations, private contractors who get big government contracts to implement a whole range of things in peace processes. NGOs increasingly deploy gender advisors. And as I mentioned earlier, there is also this trend of inclusion advisors. Now, inclusion advisors have got pretty big TORs. They're not just dealing with women, they're dealing with young people, um, people living with disability, 
um, gay, lesbian, queer people. There's a whole range of people that they are responsible for trying to involve and include substantively in peace talks. So what we see in the field of gender advice is that it's pretty mixed, to be frank and honest. We're seeing advisors that are not senior enough. We're seeing advisors that don't have enough decision making. Gender advisors are often working with very hostile colleagues within their organisations, as well as their counterparts. We're also seeing, and this is a hard truth, that we have gender advisors that are not gender experts. They're people that have just, as sometimes happens in the world of international peace processes, have stumbled into a really important position. So we're seeing three broad types of gender advisors. We're seeing people who have come from the world of um, women's rights and, and gender equality, who now have a peace and security mandate and they're not so hot on that front. We're seeing peace and security people who don't have the necessary gender expertise and women's rights expertise. And then we're seeing a third group of people, much smaller, who have the both. And what we want to do is to support and encourage those first two groups to cross-fertilise, build knowledge, and we want that third group to get bigger. And this is where you come in, because we also want more men as gender advisors, but we want more men who are gender experts and on top of the peace and security brief. It is not an easy job. You're working with people that are not interested in what you want to say and are not interested in taking your advice. There's possibly quite high rates of burnout in the, in the gender advisor field. So another thing that we're trying to do is create longevity and to make it an attractive profession, one that you can build a really stimulating and rewarding career around. But there's a number of things that the international community needs to do. So for the high level review in 2015, as well as the newly announced peace operations review, there's some pretty critical policy opportunities. And again, this is where you come into play, that you can be presenting to those two very important policy making processes next year, perspectives on men involved in peace and security, masculinities, in um, conflict prevention and conflict resolution, as well as the necessity of getting more men into gender advisor roles. Now, if you imagine, and I struggled to um, invoke this war story kind of analogy, but gender advisors are almost like a Trojan horse for getting gender justice into peace processes. They, are, they have really important roles but they also need to be accountable to the women's rights movements of the countries that they're working in. And that's another phenomenon that we're seeing, gender advisors who are detached from the women um, and the men in those countries that they are ostensibly working to improve both gender outcomes in the peace process for and more sustainable um, peace processes. So we need more gender advisors in the system and we especially need more men. Next year, headlines. 2015 is a really key year. For those of you who didn't quite follow, a couple of weeks ago the Peace Operations Review um, was announced. An international review, eminent panel of experts, 11 men and three women, because it's 2014 and we can't find enough women to go on to a peace operations review experts process. This was in the week of 1325's anniversary. So again, as Isabel has referenced, we see a disconnect between the fuzzy, fuzzy, powerless thing that 1325 apparently is to a lot of international community types and then the hard serious political work of peace operations and our job next year is to bring them together and to start to put forward these strong policy messages about moving beyond the why to the how and gender advisors more gender advisors more strategic gender advisors and more men is really critical so very, very briefly, um, putting on my gun violence hat. So out there at some point is an exhibition called Men and Guns. It was commissioned in 2006 and it involves portraits of men from Sudan, Uganda, Guatemala, Colombia and El Salvador who were interviewed 
about their experiences either as advocates against violence or as um, victims and survivors of violence, as perpetrators of violence. So looking at men's relationships to violence from a number of different perspectives and that was to shake up in particular the armed violence community to say get a grip. First of all focus on masculinity. Secondly put, make that plural. We need to be investigating much more what is happening in relation to men and guns. Now Gary talked a bit this morning about what we know about the burden of um, armed violence and I'd like to leave you with two thoughts. So we know that um, we know how many people generally are dying every year from armed violence. But what is really important to, to also understand is the things that we're not seeing. So generally, it's accepted that there's a, a three to one, uh, the number of people die, three people are injured. But that really varies. It depends where you live, how long it took you to get to hospital, the kind of care that you got, kind of rehabilitation. Now the small arms survey estimates there's about two to seven million people living with gunshot injuries all over the world and we, um, the Surviving Gun Violence Project, argue that that is a gross underestimate for the following two reasons. The first is that we, and you in particular, know that there are many types of victimisation that are impossible to document. Psychological effects, um, brandishing, um, intimidation at gunpoint, and sexual violence at gunpoint is particularly challenging to record because the gun um, victimisation element often falls away. But the second big reason, and this when you're doing the work that you're doing all over the world, think about this, is what we call slow homicide, where there are individuals, and we know that they're predominantly men, who are injured from gun violence, who die many years later from gun violence, except on their death certificate it says infection, pressure sores, urinary tract infection. They got that urinary tract infection, they died from those pressure sores because of gun violence. So if we added in all those people into our understanding about the global burden of armed violence, you start to see that we have a much, much larger problem. What can be done about that? It's looking at the connection between health and justice systems is really critical. And I'm going to just finish now by giving you an example of why it's important. So Carlos was shot at the age of 21 in El Salvador. He was shot by a gang that he knew. He didn't bother to report the crime because there's no point in El Salvador. He and his wife and his small child moved to the other part of the city that they had always lived in. They left their family and their community. When Carlos became paraplegic, Evelyn needed to go um, out and get a second job, as well as care for him and care for the baby. Carlos was waiting for four years for a decent wheelchair. He had a second uh, used wheelchair that was leading to have him have lots of pressure sores. By intervention, which was not from the government or from um, uh, the international development system, he did get a new wheelchair. And what that immediately did in that household was it meant that Evelyn was no longer being um, physically abused and um, violated by Carlos, who was profoundly frustrated with his situation and he took his anger out on her verbally and physically. It meant that he could go out and earn some income. He got a bit of his dignity back. He could take care of himself and he could help take care of their, of their child. So when we, when if you step back and you think a bit about what Gary was saying this morning, it's health systems, criminal justice systems, working together to make sure that Carlos and his family um, are able to have some modicum of recovery and dignity post-violence. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much. I'm called David Onen from Refugee Law Project, Uganda, a country that many of you know very well for a number of things, for passing a very controversial law, which was recently denounced by court. And as a point of information, we need to prepare for another battle. There's another law coming very soon. It's being called the Prohibition and Prevention of Unnatural Sex. So very soon we shall have another battle to fight again as human rights uh, activists. And Refugee Law Project in this point, right now we are still being suspended by government on allegation of promotion of homosexuality. And for the last seven months we are not in full operation. We are just limping as an institution. So I'll be talking at this point on how do we engage men who happen to be victims or survivors of sexual violence? Because we've been talking about women as victims, but now how do you put in this man who is still also struggling as a victim, and then you're engaging him to end violence against fellow men or against uh, women? So in my presentation, I'll be looking at the experience. What are the common forms of experience that men go through during times of violence, and how that kind of experience attacks their sense of masculinity and how they struggle to regain those lost uh, masculinity, where now violence manifests. And what do we do moving forward as, as key partners? So in terms of experience, there's a number of, of issues and cases that male survivors report. Yeah, sorry. So from... From the different sessions we always have as Refugee Law Project, these are common issues that keeps coming, forced oral, iron, banana sex, sometimes with friends, relatives, or with children, which itself is not just very traumatizing, but leaves long scars in minds of people. So these drawings you see, the, 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 the two in the middle came in from groups that we work with, where you tell them, can you please draw your experience in life? You find this is the kind of drawings that come. I'm sure they talked about photo exhibition. So that connects really clearly to what people experienced. And to continue on that, you'll also find a lot of cases on tying of genitalia, either by male or female perpetrators, electric wires attached to the genitalia, forced genital mutilation, including circumcision and castration, and being forced to masturbate until ejaculation. So this kind of experience is, is compounded by being forced to witness acts of sexual violence, being used as a mattress, which is commonly reported, so from this experience, somebody who has gone through one or many of these, what does it mean to engage them? Because their sense of masculinity, gender and sexuality has completely been compromised. They have a different feeling of themselves. They have a different view of the world. And they have a different approach when you're trying to talk to them to engage women to end sex violence. Because the key question is, who are you engaging to end what happened to me so that it doesn't happen to other men and boys? So how does it attack survivor sense of sexuality, gender, and masculinity? If you look at the sexual bit or the sexuality, there's a lot of saying that I've been turned into a woman. I've been womanized. And this is the experience and how it impacts on me. And then there's a whole common saying of, I think I must be homosexual. So the sense of sexuality is completely distorted. And in the middle of session, sometimes say, but I was able to gain an erection. So I already have a justification that I should be homosexual. So you have to go further miles to explain that sexual arousal or physical arousal is not necessarily a manifestation of being homosexual. So, and more still, you find many others now are unable to marry or even have children. They keep asking, I don't think I can marry anymore. So you see how they're already being affected by the experience of what happened to them. Uh, sorry for the typo there. It's, uh, in terms of sexual functions, we struggle with the medics, with the medical service providers, into trying to sort temporal and permanent impotence. You find men are no longer able to satisfy the women on bed. So the women would, in turn, after a long time, decide to go to the immediate neighbor, and the man is forced not to say a word because he's not able to do it anyway. So as a man, you're forced to, to, to keep it. Who do you say? Because you can't do it anyway. So if a woman decides to stay in the names of her children, she will go to another man for sexual satisfaction, or she would completely abandon you for another man. Now, how does it impact in terms of uh, responsibilities in society. You find household leadership, men failing to command respect, because there's a common saying, if you start quarreling with the wives, she returns. If you continue, I'll send you to the men who did what they did to you. 
or they ask you, how many men do we have in this room? None, because all of us were sexually violated. There's no man in the room. We're all women. So you now see how violence starts, the root of the violence. In terms of social responsibilities, they're now regarded as weak and inferior men, failing to defend themselves against perpetrators and failing to defend families. And also a shift on, in terms of financial muscles, because these men, and I'm talking about refugees specifically, coming from a third country which mainly use uh, languages which is not English best as their first language, they've been failing to cope in their country of asylum. You can't find a job even if you are qualified from your country of origin. And for refugees from Democratic Republic of Congo, the government no longer equates their academic papers. So they can't join higher institutes of learning. You can't easily be, get engaged in Uganda because they're being accused of, of, of forging papers. So the government said, any paper from DR Congo, whether it is genuine or not genuine, we're not wasting time trying to inquire whether it is genuine. We're not doing it. So what does it mean now? You're not able to find a suitable job. Even if you're able, you're physically sick, you're not able to, to do that job. So leaving women uh, as key financial lords in the house, and that itself turns the politics of the economy in the family. And also children not able to assimilate in the society because of stories that people know about your father and what happened to them. So in return, you find that all these are triggered by a very host community which is very, very homogeneous. The translator to, to enter the room. And then the structural gaps in terms of the services available for male survivors of sexual violence and the whole cultural norms around surrounding the rape of men and the taboo of it. And worst of it, in the gap there, we have uh, discriminative legislation. Our laws in Uganda, when you're trying to define what rape is, the man becomes silent, and our penal code does not basically recognize male rape as a crime, and it excludes men in the definition of rape as well as uh, assault. Where you see, I've added emphasis bolded there that any person who unlawful has unlawful canon knowledge of a woman, a girl without her consent. So, if you're a man, you're saying you've been raped. Say, yeah, but the police say, but men cannot be raped anyway. It does not exist in our laws. So there's nowhere to charge it anyway. So these are structural gaps that uh, we struggle with. Now, after all this experience, compounded by all what I've said, you find that male survivors will now try to regain their lost masculinities by use of violence, by starting functional complaints to service providers, humanitarian aid workers, and people in communities. And then there's a whole reported disrespect for authority and resorting to unlawful acts. You find teenagers becoming so violent in communities because their issues are not being addressed. You find refugees in the settlements moving from one zone to the other with no proper explanation to government authorities. Why are you shifting from one place to another? Yet the underlying issue there is, I probably participated in acts of sexual violence that I perpetrated on somebody, and now we are a refugee. The person I did the act to also came in as, as a refugee. So how do we stay as neighbors? I have to move to another location. As you move, you stay for six months, there's another new entrance. So you have to keep moving. And they can't tell government officials. At the end of the day, when they are forced to stay in one place, they become violent. We've heard of uh, some uh, camp commandant of one refugee settlement who was torn to death in a land wrangle. But digging deeper, the, the, the land debate was just one thing. There was all going anger from some refugees because of this kind of, of issues, where they just find opportunity if they, can, if they can fight back. So others turn to alcohol, abuse. But now the big question is, what do we do moving forward? I think, like we say, first thing first, it is very difficult to engage men, and I've been talking this morning, do we engage men, or do we engage with men, or we work with men? I know English is a little difficult, but these are key things we continue struggling with, that we need to first address uh, the, the, the issues that are affecting men by providing for themselves spaces to report cases, and to be able to explain to service providers what happened and addressing the physical and psychological needs before which you cannot engage them or you cannot engage with them or you will not work with them easily because they also still have untreated wounds that need somebody to, to sort. And that is why they sometimes transform those violence in their families. And addressing the triggers which I've said about how do we get our laws functional so that we support uh, male survival of sexual violence. How about strengthening local movement? I think we've been talking about it that we need to encourage formation of organized groups as Refugee Law Project, we are pioneering a project where we bring male survivor groups to once in a while meet with female survivor groups. 
to sit on table and at least talk key issues. At what point do we come together? Can we do joint activities together? We are talking about experiences that happen to us as men. You are talking about experiences that happen to us as women. Where do we go in terms of advocacy? So it's a very interesting meeting if you sit in to see how men and women can agree on common points to move forward in terms of advocacy and lobbying. And also involving men and boys in structural and policy changes. You'll see male survivors meeting key policy uh, people and law enforcers in Kampala to try to tell them that, A, we can't report cases because even there's no law anyway, so why would we bother? So as key policy makers, you have a role in the fight against uh, sexual violence against men and boys. And also rethinking our work with younger and older generation. Like when we talk about men, what category of men are we looking at? Are we looking at married men only? That because they can do caregiving, because they have children and women. How about this man who is not married? He's old enough. How about this man who has been divorced by the wife for one reason or another? So we need to think about all this. And the, the, the older person's discussion, I've not seen it still coming clearly, but it's another area of work. We work with a whole group of refugee elder persons, 60 years plus. They're often neglected according to what they say because they say they don't bring anything most, uh, much on table, but they have a lot of, of roles because, A, they still have these skip generational responsibilities. They still have duties in their homes, and they're the ones teaching young children how to go forward, how to preserve this culture, which is anyway rigid. So if we leave them out, it, it, it's really, really going to be a little difficult for us. And even the younger generation, how do we engage or work with uh, young school-going children? And then talking about regional and international partnership, I think we need to be thinking about how do we facilitate survivors to move and meet other survivors from different parts of the world to see what happens and how they can engage in the global agenda. Thank you so much.